Vibhi Vidyotamana Pramodotamani Savidyot Abrava Vipir Yatha Namaha Savidyot Abrava Vipir Yatha Namaha So is that about twelve times? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Pratishnu Virya Parito Virajate Pratishnu Virya Parito Virajate Vasadimana Validir Mahatmana Like the sky decorated with both clouds and lightning. 
So please repeat. The Vaikuntha planets, the Vaikuntha planets are also surrounded, are also surrounded, by, various surrounded by various airplanes. All glowing and brilliantly situated. All glowing and brilliantly situated. These airplanes, These airplanes belong to the great Mahatmas, belong to the great Mahatmas or, devotees of the Lord. or devotees of the Lord. The ladies are as beautiful, the ladies are as, beautiful as, lightning, as lightning because of their celestial complexions. Because of their celestial complexion. And all these combined together, and all these combined together appear just like the sky, appear just like the sky, decorated with both clouds and lightning. Decorated with both clouds and lightning. Can someone turn the page on that book over there? Prabhupada's book. Thank you. So, okay. Now, the purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, It appears that in the Vaikuntha planets, there are also airplanes brilliantly glowing, and they are occupied by the great devotees of the Lord, with ladies of celestial beauty as brilliant as lightning. As there are airplanes, so there must be different types of carriages like airplanes, but they may not be driven by machines, as we have experienced in this world because everything is of the same nature of eternity, bliss and knowledge. The airplanes and carriages are of the same quality as Brahman. Mm -hmm. Although there is nothing except Brahman, one should not mistakenly think that there is only void and no variegatedness. Thinking like that is due to a poor fund of knowledge. Otherwise, no one would have such a, a misconception of voidness in Brahman as there are airplanes, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> so there must be cities and houses and everything else just suitable to the particular planets. One should not carry the ideas of imperfection from this world to the transcendental world and not take it into consideration and not take into consideration the nature of the atmosphere as completely free from the influence of time, etc as described previously. The verse again is, I have a Tulsi leaf stuck in my throat. Mm -hmm. mm. The Vaikuntha planets are also surrounded by various airplanes, all glowing and brilliantly situated. These airplanes belong to the great Mahatmas or devotees of the Lord. The ladies are as beautiful as lightning because of their celestial complexions. And all these combined together appear just like the sky, decorated with both clouds and lightning. So what's being described here is an actual revelation of, you know, the, uh, Lord, Lord Brahma, um, after his austerities uh, and tapasya, he's all of a sudden the curtain's been lifted and he's being allowed a vision of eternity, of reality. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was thinking about this last night, that often it's said, you know, I grew up in a Catholic background, but I'm sure pretty much all Christians or any denomination, generally speaking, um, I don't know what the atheists say, but um, at a wake, after someone passed away, the standard line is, well, they've gone to a better place. Well, what is that better place? What does it look like? Is there any description? I mean, uh, you know, and, and I don't mean anything derogatory towards any of the other bona fide religious um, systems, but in Catholicism, um, I remember seeing a stained glass window in one of our churches, I think it was the Miraculous Medal or Sacred Heart. We had three, we had St. Anthony's, and the Italians would all come for that big feast every fall, you know, fall to St. Anthony's. There was a big thing that all come from Brooklyn. And so, and then uh, Sacred Heart and Miraculous Medal. On one of these stained glass windows, they had a picture of the father sitting in a big throng, with long white hair, long beard, and his face was like sunshine. And clouds everywhere, and then there was Jesus, and above was the Holy, the Holy Spirit for the Holy Ghost, which was like a dove. That was what we saw. And so, you know, you would say, well, what is it like there? Well, you know, I remember one nun telling us at catechism class 
that you'll, uh, you know, you'll all get to go and be angels. Wouldn't you all like to be angels? Mm -hmm. And out of a class of about 15, you know, 15 people, we were all about, you know, pre-teens, maybe sixth grade. Yeah, so I don't know what age that is, I can't think. But, um, they said, okay, yeah, so they, they said, well, how, wouldn't you all, she said, wouldn't you all like to be one? And I went, yeah! I was the only one. <laughs> and I was like, what? And she was surprised too. I mean, I think, wow, like, you get wings, you get fly. But I think the thought of being an angel, you know, like this age, I want to be, you know, a rebel, you know, be good. Uh, so, but that's not the kind of angel we're talking about. So, and then you have other traditions. I mean, I remember meeting, um, and again, not to be, it's not a good idea to try to promote Krishna consciousness by denigrating someone else. So, but I'm just making the point that I, I remember reading um, something uh, at when uh, Billy Graham came to Atlanta in the early 70s, like 72 or something, 73, and then uh, of his uh, speech was in the Atlanta Journal Constitution. And he said the day of the rapture when Jesus comes again and establishes heaven on earth, that all the Christians that have been left behind will now rise up out of the graves. And I'm thinking, that sounds like the you know, like some kind of zombie movie or something. <laughs> People coming up out of the graves. I mean, so uh, and then there was another incident where the Seventh Day Adventists. Um, I think it's the Seventh-day Adventists. They're right down the road from the Atlanta Temple. And they invited us over one night. And they had this huge mural on the wall. And I think they're the ones that say there's only 300,000 families on the planet that are qualified to go to the kingdom of God. And on the, on the wall, there was like a big painting of a scene from like a suburban middle-class family sitting down at dinner with like a roast beef and all the vegetables and the father and the mother and the two kids uh, at, say like in the 60s version of, you know, Leave it to Beaver or something. And then over here was the exact same picture but it was more glowing. And I said, so what is this? He said, well, that's heaven. And it was exactly the same as the picture of of uh, a lot of people. That, and I said, so it's like, you know, like when you see a movie, with the old fashioned movies, the, the, the films, so, so, you know, there's frames, and each frame you see like people, and you're moving like this, and you're changing, and, and then you're, you know, so you, it's, you, but so in other words, they got stuck on that one frame, no one's, you're going to be always 12 years old, your sister's always going to be nine, and you're always going to be that. It makes no sense. I mean, and what was so good about that? But, and the only reason I, I'm saying this is because they just have a poor fund of knowledge. It's not that they're bad. I actually was thinking very, um, I had an interesting realization and I want sort of, I wasn't going to talk about it right away, but since it's sort of a quiet, informal setting in front of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and, and, uh, and the founder Acharya of, um, of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness and, and his very sincere followers here. Um, I was thinking about the Ten Commandments in a way that I had never thought of before. That, you know, often we kind of talk about it as just uh, a moral, like sub-religious principles, just moral things like don't steal, don't lie, don't kill, don't be envious, you know, don't covet. But actually, if you think about it, it's like aphorisms for that, you know, honor thy father and thy mother, you know, and there's many mothers, and the father's represent, supposed to be a representative, you know, of the guru, he's like a guru, and there's many gurus, and, uh, you know, worship the supreme personality, you've got to have one god, and, and don't have many gods, and no false, false idols, like money, fame, uh, things like that. And um, 
And then it says, don't covet. I don't know exactly what it is, but don't covet. Well, so why did we fall down? Because here we just read, we were envious of the Supreme Personality of God. So when we're down here, it, it's basically telling us, don't be envious. Don't be envious of this part and parcel of God. Don't be envious of what He has, because what He has is coming from God. Don't, don't in other words, don't, have, uh, uh, don't be attached to God's possessions. To God's property. Don't steal someone else's property. In other words, don't steal from God. Because we're all caretakers. We're all stewards here. And when someone says to you, have you stolen this? Don't lie about it. Because God sees it. Don't kill his parts and parcels. Don't kill the spiritual soul. The spirit soul. Don't kill the spiritual life. Don't kill his parts and parcels opportunities. Don't feed on the flesh of one that you know his embodied souls are in, uh, and you can actually see how because in, in the Bhagavad Gita and the Srimad Bhagavatam it's telling us everything belongs to God, everything belongs to Krishna, and we're all his parts and parcels, and he's witnessing everything. He is the supreme proprietor of everything. All we get to do is we get an allotment and then. We're able to manage that in His service. So don't, don't start falsely thinking, now this is mine, and I, li- I want His, and hers, and I like her, and you know, I want that too. But it's all God's. And here, in this situation, these people are flying around, beautiful women, in, in airplanes, and there's no lust, there's no selfishness, there's no envy, there's no jealousy. That's how you get to be there. You, you don't have those qualities that we have here. And what is the, there was something about the verse that, that um, something about these, um, the qualities of Vermont. What time is it? I, okay, so, so it says, all these combined together appear in the spiritual sky. You know, these airplanes are nice and beautiful. Anyway, there was some place where it said something, maybe in the purport, that everything is of Vermont. And it's, uh, all these other qualities are absent, con- conspicuous by its absence. Don't mistake this. So, and then so, so the other side of the coin also is, so what other religious, in, in other words, what other religion or what other scientific um, knowledge or what other philosophy like Stoicism, or the Greeks' philosophies, or what other other philosophies, or, you know, the uh, voidism, impersonalism, what other um, alternative is more sublime than this? Who's got something better? Like, there's an example in in Australia where Prabhu went on this one television show, Churu tells this story, Prabhu, and... This, guy, this person who had the show was a real, um, you know, he was famous for like humiliating his guests. And it had sort of like a, one of those old fashioned love seats, it goes like this. Mm-hmm. So Prabhupada came to sit down and he put the picture of Gopal Krishna, that beautiful one, you know, where the calf is there, you know, really beautiful picture of Krishna. And he puts him down, sits next to him. And so the man goes, so that's your God? He goes, yes, that's my God. And his name is Krishna and he lives in Goloka. And he likes to tend cows, and he likes to play a flute. He wears a peacock feather in his hair. So, that's my God. So you tell me about your God. What do you have to say? They have nothing to say. So even if you, you say, well, this is just imaginary, it's mythology, well, <clears throat> without even getting into the point of descending knowledge and how we're receiving knowledge, everything that we get is coming from some other higher authority. Everything we know, we've been taught by higher authorities. Even like when they show us these pictures of this moon rover, it looks like a little erectuset, you know, stupid little thing. It costs us, you know, I don't know, maybe a billion dollars, and it's, you know, going around in desert that's been so, it's like been colored red, and it's on Mars. Yeah, okay, sure. You know, our, we have descriptions in the in the in the, in the scriptures of the how on all of these uh, these uh, uh, planets in the material world, 
are their cities. They're very, um, some of these places are heavenly. Celestial people are living there. There's no such thing as, you know, just a void. There's no, we're not the only, this whole universe, this is one little dot, this earth planet, and every, it's completely covered with life in places where no, uh, like where we, no one could possibly exist. Way down deep in the ocean, the pressure so there's no light. The pressure would crush any human being. But yet there's living entities down there, living in the most coldest places, uh, freezing. You know, in Antarctica, in Antarctica, there's living entities in the ice. There's living entities everywhere on this planet. But yet, once you get out of our, uh, you know, the 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 oxygen and past this point of the earth, everything is dead. That just doesn't, that's just insulting to, uh, if, you have, if you're a theist, that God can't create. And, that, and this is just some random thing that's happened to you. And, but what is it, and what's going to happen at the end? Well, you're just, you're going to go into the earth, your chemicals, and it'll all just be, um, churned up and you'll be, you know, and help fertilize the trees. You know, there's no, so why should I follow any kind of rules? Why should I not just do whatever I want whenever I want? Why is there any kind of order? Why don't we just randomly do whatever we felt, feel like doing? Why do we try to keep some kind of system of uh, respect for one another and have laws? Because we know there's consequences to all of our actions. And, and here, we're getting an actual description of what it looks like in Vaikuntha. And where, it, by following this particular process, we can go there. All throughout history, our recent history, we hear all these stories of, you know, these explorers that go out, like Ponce de Leon, or Ponce de Leon. He went off in, across the ocean, a great struggle, to find the fountain of youth. He wanted, they, there was a rumor, there's a fountain of youth, and he went through the swamps of Florida, mosquitoes, snakes, alligators, trying to find the fountain of youth. Then there were the Cortez, and, and, and those fellows went over to South America looking for the city of gold, El Dorado. There's people constantly looking for uh, the uh, Ark of the Covenant, or the, what's the, uh, the, the Holy Grail. When you drink of the Holy Grail, you become eternal. They're all looking for this, and Ark of the Covenant, all knowledge is contained. Constantly searching for everything that we already are. We are always young. We are always blissful. We are eternal. We never die. It's all within us. You don't have to, any great endeavor, you know, build machines and f try to get off into space, and if, if you ever saw the little capsule that came back, so-called, came back from the moon, and you know that it had to go through this radiation field, and you see this thing, it's like a tin can with some plywood. That thing wouldn't last a second. It'd be just a crisp, you know, just a little piece of some dust. And they said that they flew through that field of radiation and made it to moon and back. Uh-uh. It's just... We're being sold, and uh, you know, a bill of you know goods here, not good goods. Here is the truth. Here's everything everyone is looking for in these books. That's what Prabhupada's given us, and he's given us the process on how we can actually go there and live like that. You know, flying in a plane used to be really fun. Now, flying in a plane, you got to take off your shoes. You gotta go through some x ray machine. We gotta check you out. Then you sit, get in the, 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 the plane, and there's no room to move. You're in a cattle car. It's like a, a Greyhound bus in the sky. You have to sit like this, go back a little bit like that, get some loud kids screaming next to you. It's awful. There's no, there's no, here they're flying in planes. You know, it's a, uh, there's a description of a plane that. Cardo Mamuni that we're going to read in a few months, uh, and this was within the material world, what to speak of these spiritual planes. 
I think because there's no fuel problem and there's no you know extra fees for the luggage. There's not not none of the not it's everything that we, we think is wonderful and great trying to imitate is already there and we we are belong there. We made a mistake. We were a little envious. Now we make it up and stop being envious. It's not easy. You know, so there was this story of Karam Muni. It's coming up. Karam Muni was a great, he's one of the original Pajapadins. So, hold on a second. He had to produce some, uh, sit, uh, some children. That was his order from Lord Brahma. Or from his father, I think. His father might have been Daksha. Can't remember. But, um, so he starts performing, but he's also, he's very serious about getting out of this uh, karmic uh, action, reaction. He wants to get out. He, I mean, he really understands the higher plane, but he has a responsibility to produce children. He's been given that instruction. So he sits down and he performs great austerities uh, on the banks of the river Saraswati for like a thousand years or something. This was in a Satya Yuga. And then the Lord comes to him. And he's amazed. He's so beautiful. And the Lord is standing on the back of Garuda, floating there. And it describes how beautiful he looks and the jewelry and, and how glowing he is. Which, you know, going back to what the Christian the Catholics say about the face of Jesus, and, you know, it says in the Shri Shri you're praying, please remove that your glowing effulgence so I can actually see your face. So, and I, and I, but the white hair, maybe that's a director of Charlie, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we got everything. So, um, uh, so the Lord is pleased with his austerities, and he says, "I know your heart. I know what your desires are." The day after tomorrow, I believe it's Swami Guru Manu, who's the emperor at this time. Mm -hmm. He he's going to come to visit you with his wife. They're both very very qualified. And they have a very beautiful daughter who will be a good wife here. She's qualified. And you will accept her as your wife. You will fulfill her desires for children. And then I will appear in her womb, uh, one of my incarnations, which is Kapila, to give knowledge. And so this happens. You know, they, in two days, all of a sudden, Swainu Manu and, uh, and his wife, I wish I could remember her name. Anyway, they come, the daughter's name is Devahuti, and she was, apparently, she's so beautiful that one of the Gandharvas, uh, I, I think, it might have been, I think his name is Vishwarupa or something like that, he's flying over, and they, you know, it says in this, the description of these palaces, and they're like seven stories high. There were, you know, skyscrapers is not a new thing. That was, you know, back then. And she was on the roof playing with a ball, and he was so att attracted to her, he fell out of his plane. The prophet said it might have even been a helicopter. So that's how beautiful she was. And so she comes, and everything is arranged. And so she's serving him very nicely, but he's a, you know, he's an ascetic. And so she completely surrenders herself to him and does exactly as, you know, was required. Just the way, um, and forgetting about her appearance, you know, her hair becomes matted, her, hair, uh, her body is covered mm -hmm. with dirt, her clothes are just like rags. And after some time, Karam Muni, he realizes, because he has the ability to understand someone's heart, he realizes she's very unhappy and he knows why. And then he says to her, you know, he, she's, you know, he asks, is, there, is everything, you know, would you like to have, um, put, you know, the children? And she says, yes, my Lord, but whatever pleases you. So he says, go and take bath there in the Bindusarovra uh, lake, which is part of the river Saraswati. Bindusarovra is a lake that was created by Vishnu's tears. She dives in, and when she dives in, there's a mansion there with a thousand beautiful celestial girls that all smell like lotus flowers. And they're there only to serve her. They bathe her and they 
apply ointments and sandalwood pulp all over her. They clean her hair. They give her nice, beautiful cloths to wear. Decorate her body with jewelry so that she's now re and then they provide her some Ayur Ayurvedic um, uh, drink that uh, it's it's it says it's an intoxicant, but it's not liquor or it's not intoxicant in the, in the sense that we think it, it invigorates her, it gives her energy, and she comes out and then he uh, by his mystic powers creates a palace. But it's an aerial mansion. This is an airplane. A palace that flies. You know, they're making a big deal out of these planes now that down in the, the, what, what was the uh, luggage area, they make these like two room, three room uh, little apartments. Have you seen pictures of these things? They have like, they're like $15,000 a pop, you know, to go one way. And, um, you know, it's just a little room, you know, very small for one room and then a little bedroom and a little kitchenette and you got to pay a lot of money. But he built a mansion. It was seven stories high. There were lakes with swans and pigeons and beautiful birds and lotus flowers. Everything. Everything was there. And this thing just floated in the air. And he took her off to Mount Meru where all the demigods, Var Varuna and Indra, and Chandra and all the different demigods from all the different directions, they all go there for their um, recreational time. And then they begin to, uh, it gets, you know, at some point, you know, in a very nice way, describes how he pleases her. He expands himself nine times uh, in order to fulfill her desires. And she becomes, after Many, many years, they're enjoying together, but it seems like a moment. She has now nine daughters. They're all born within a day. And now, he's done what he said he would do, and he's getting ready to leave. And she starts to touch the ground with her foot like this, and which indicates that she's not happy. And he's looking at her and says, I've done everything you wanted. She said, but I... You know, I am, who's going to protect me? Who's going to take care of me? And then he informs her that very soon the Lord will appear within your womb and he'll take birth. The Supreme Personality of God. And it's described there that this is not such a big, wonderful thing like this so-called, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Immaculate Conception. Because Prabhupada points out, well, <clears throat> we have Paramatma in our hearts. So what's What's so difficult about Paramatma going into the woman's womb? How is that such a difficult thing? We all carry Paramatma within our hearts. He's already there. He's in there, every one of us. So then Kapila comes, but my, uh, that's another whole story. But the point is, there was a plane. He made a plane by his mystic power that was a palace. What do we got? We got these tin cans that are really uncomfortable to fly in. No turbulence, you know, no, you know, engine problems, no terrorists, you know, n none of the inconveniences that we have. No drunk passengers making everything uh, difficult, no uh, mysterious disappearance, no being shot down from the air. Beautiful floating palaces. No virus. What? No virus. <laughs> N nothing, no virus, nothing. No, it's all, it's all, and this is, but this is in the material world. So you can imagine what is being described here in Vaikuntha. This is, planes in Vaikuntha, possibly made of flowers, and the, and the palace is described, the floor is emerald, and with, decorated with coral daisies. The dome is sapphire, and it has a golden top to it. Sapphire is like a blue gem. All the archways are, are golden, and the pillars are pearls with uh, some other gems, I can't remember. Just beyond, the, and that's in what Cardinal Mamuni made. What to speak of what these planes are. And they're eternal. There's no 
uh, fuel problem, there's no scarcity, there's no fear, it's all bliss. And Prabhupada, people have been searching and trying to, in other words, they take this material creation and they try to reverse engineer it. Like, you know, in other words, they, sometimes they say they find things from UFOs or from your enemies. They take that, what it is they made, and then they try to understand how it was made. Like if I don't, if I didn't, I didn't have the handbook to the camera and it was broken, I try to take it apart and figure out how they made it so I can fix it. So these scientists, what they're doing, this is creation all around them. They're trying to reverse engineer it, figure out how it was made so we can make it better or how we can exploit it for ourselves. Somebody created it. And that somebody is a loving, uh, you know, merciful, compassionate, the Supreme Personality of God, who's unlimited. You can't compete with Him. You can never compete. We're so tiny. And He's just calling for us constantly. And we can see Him first through sound vibration. And that sound vibration is, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Again, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. One more time, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram. through sound. That's how we see Him. And, you know, I am not a good example of this process. You know, uh, I can't even really explain exactly everything that's in my heart. Uh, I'm filled with faults. But I, I'm, uh, I feel very fortunate to be here and you giving me some time to explain some of my realization. And I would just like to stress, and I really mean this, and not the Sundari, she can back me up on this, in the sense that when you read something, and Vedanta Kurt as well, when you read something, you know, you get an understanding of it. But it's when you try to explain it. That's when it becomes yours. Yes, very much so. That realization, putting it into words, or you write it down, that's the next step. Of course, you can reach perfection just by listening, like Mars Pariket did. But Mars Pariket also, right before he left, he preached to his mother. So, anything else? Excellent class, wonderful class. Krishna, twelve Prabhupada. Yes, Bishma. Um, you're talking about like Mars Rover and this. Yeah, yeah. They had an article in the paper that says there seems to be a rodent problem on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> was taken magnifying the pictures from the... Uh, from oh the, my goodness, yeah! Some guy was magnifying the pictures that they took. These, it, look, it looks like a little mouse or a yeah, baby rat or something. Could, there's articles if you scroll down on it. Just how are you going to... Uh, do what, do what do you type in? Just mouse like a moon, uh, mouse, mouse, mouse on, on Mars, Mars from the moon <laughs> rover. <Mars laughs> rover. Thank you, God. Thank you. They're exposed. <laughs> <laughs> They'll have some explanation for that. Thank you, Hare Bo, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hey, I'm a fool. I'm a fool.